Uh, yeah, so the first presentation is on a recycling game that we made for children. So it was actually targeted towards an audience of 8 to 12. Um, and uh, I, I'll kind of go over the background of how it came to be, why it came to be, and kind of how we approached the entire uh, game. Um, and first I'll show you, if I can get this to work, a video, just so you have some context of what I'm talking about. Um, it was basically a first-person shooter. Um, you were collecting stuff with a vacuum cleaner. Um, there was an issue with violence, so we wanted to make sure that there was no violence involved. So we had a vacuum trash you vac picking up the garbage and shooting at the garbage. Um, so we found that the kids really liked this. It was familiar with games that they were already playing, so they kind of liked that aspect as well. Uh, yeah, so you basically go through different levels of the house. Uh, there's seven levels. Um, each level has different items in it. Um, all of the different items kind of increase in difficulty within the levels. So um, as you go on, you eventually get things like kitty litter. And it, within different municipalities, it's different. Um, so some you can put in the garbage and some you can take to compost. And it really depends on the municipality. So we, we came across a, a lot of different things like that. Um, so I just kind of wanted to address, before we get into it, some of the challenges that I see, um, there we go, some, some of the challenges that I see with um, gamifying serious games and some of the challenges that we've come across. Um, and it's really, we've noticed a lot of serious games that just don't really have an effective combination of um, gameplay mechanics with the educational content. Um, so there seems to be a big disconnect with how do we make the content the fun part instead of having like a mini game and then having something that's around the educational content after. How do we combine those and make them um, both entertaining and both engaging and actually um, encourage the player to want to play more? Um, so the, the importance is really on challenging the player on the educational content itself versus challenging them separately on both the game and advancing in the game and then separately on the educational content and advancing that. Um, so it's really just putting them together and, and how that can be uh, paired together. Um, so this game in particular was actually um, before the company was founded. So this one was uh, part of a capstone project in uh, university. Um, I'm not sure why it keeps on changing. So. Uh, anyways, okay, so the, the intent and core purpose for this, the, the municipal, m municipality approached us to say, we want to make an educational game for recycling. And we want it to be fun and for 8 to 12 year olds, and we want to just make recycling cool. And uh, so that was kind of a huge challenge for us because how do you make recycling cool and how do you talk about garbage and waste and different things with kids um, and get them interested. Uh, so that was really the intent. Um, but there was also a secondary intent. They really wanted to see if we could drive home that educational content to the parents. Um, so they were, they were kind of thinking, and this actually turned out to be very true, where if the kids learn something, they kind of race home and they tell mom and dad. Or if they see mom and dad doing a certain action and they've learned something different, they'll kind of point it out. Um, so it's almost kind of taking that information and, and putting it to the parents, where the parents aren't really engaged with recycling methods and practices either. Um, so there was two intents there, but it was really meant for kids. And the learning objectives, um, this is something that I really find with serious games. It's, it's really important to, um, to take a moment to, before you do the design, figure out what learning objectives you're, you're looking to cover. Um, so for us, we had the, the municipality kind of saying, we want to cover these topics. We want them to know these different things uh, about these specific waste items. Um, so we were able to work with them to create a really clear list of, okay, the game has to include all of these items. It has to be uh, based on this kind of information, and this is the general objective that we're trying to reach. Um, so having that interaction with content experts about whatever topic that is right from the beginning before the design starts is really effective, and we found that to be a really good use. So then from there, you kind of look at it like, okay, how are we going to make this fun? Now we have a list of everything that we have to teach, and what are we going to do about this? Um, I'm really not sure why it keeps on skipping. Um, so yeah, we, we really wanted to sit down and say, okay, how do we make this fun, and how do we make it exciting for the kids? Um, so we looked at, I don't know if someone technical can help figure out why it keeps on skipping. Um, I'm not sure if it's on like an auto, because I've put everything down. Sorry. But yeah, I don't, come off. I don't know. Maybe like close it open up again. I'm not sure. Right. 
Okay, so I'll keep on talking about the design. So we, we sat down and we said, okay, how are we going to make this fun and what are we going to do about this? Uh, so our team has a lot of really creative individuals, so they were coming up with all these crazy ideas and, okay, we're going to do almost like a first-person shooter slash platformer uh, game and it's going to be a 3D environment and it's going to be all fantasy and kind of in this weird uh, environment and things like that. So we actually ended up um, preparing a whole pitch presentation and we, we took it to them and said, okay, is this kind of what you were thinking? And they looked at it and we actually worked with the content experts to kind of pick out pieces that they liked. So they said, okay, well, I like this element, I like this element, but the fantasy world, that's just not gonna cut it. Like, we can't have it in, in a weird environment. We wanna have it in a realistic environment. Um, so we had a lot of back and forth and a lot of give and take, but I think it was really effective in, in helping ensure that the content accuracy and the messaging was coming through in a, in a good way. So then from there, we kind of looked at style and, um, and played with how that would really impact the game as well. Um, we wanted to make sure that although they were saying, okay, we don't want a fantasy environment and it's going to be a real environment, it's going to be a real house, okay, well, that's kind of boring. So you're talking about recycling and that's boring and you're talking about waste and garbage and really who wants to talk about that? And then you want to put it in a realistic environment. Uh, so for us, when we looked at it, we said, okay, we can't make a super realistic environment because it's just going to be too boring. It's too much like real life and, and it's too just not exciting for the kids. Uh, so we looked at kind of things that they were already playing. We, we kind of took little elements from here and there. Um, and we wanted to really create something that was cartoony and fun, but still a realistic house environment with items that they would see on a daily basis. Um, but we really found that just incorporating that use of style was effective in engaging the kids because a lot of them would see it and they're like, oh, that looks cool or oh, that's exciting. And they, they were kind of attracted to colors and different things like that. So I find that within serious games as well, you can kind of use that to play up whatever you're trying to do. Uh, in this case, we really wanted them to be engaged. Um, so in some cases, it might be something else. And then for the points and scoring, uh, this was a really quick game that we did. Uh, it was around a four-month development cycle, so and it was part-time on that. So we had a really simple point system. Um, it was very basic. Uh, you just collected points on uh, every time you sorted something correctly. Um, you would collect points or gain points if you did it fast. So if you were slower, you lost points. And if you sorted it incorrectly, you lost points as well. Um, then you could post your score onto a leaderboard, and that leaderboard was just local. We didn't have it networked or anything like that. But we found that even in the testing sessions that we did and the demo days, that kids were competing from computer to computer without having the comparison on that leaderboard. So it was kind of interesting. Um, and they were also competing on a, a level by le level basis uh, and scores and what, did you get this item yet or did you get that item yet? So they were almost having a competition with themselves without even having that incorporation within the game. So it was kind of interesting as well. So I just kind of wanted to touch on this because it's interesting. So there were some strange things that we learned. Um, one of them was that, again, the scoring system, although it was simple, it was really interesting to see this um, you know, kind of collaboration and competition that came outside of the game, where kids were talking about it and actively um, challenging each other. Um, and it wasn't done through the game, and the game wasn't pushing them to do that. Um, also, another thing that's kind of odd, but just something for anyone who's making uh, games for kids, is that kids' hands are a lot smaller than ours. So when we were designing and creating the control scheme, it was, for us, um, it made sense. And then when we got the kids there, their hands were a lot shorter, so they couldn't reach the different keys that they needed to reach on the keyboard. Um, so it's just another uh, funny thing that we kind of learned, and we looked at it during the user, ses user testing sessions. So we actually were watching them kind of struggle to, to hit one key or another key. Uh, so having that uh, focus testing early on helped us establish a lot of different things that included. Um, another thing too with educational games is that you have to be kind of careful. Um, not everything uh, for the messaging is consistent based on what organization is establishing that. So for us in this uh, case, it was the municipalities. Some of them, like I said earlier, can recycle certain things, can compost certain things. Some of them have to be put in the trash. So it's um, kind of a, a challenge to make sure that you're constantly staying on top of what messaging, um, what organization is using. And then to just go over some good practices. Um, again, as I mentioned earlier, I think that really for serious games um, and making them, is, it, it's really important to actually 
engage with content experts really early on um, to have a good connection and relationship with them from the start, uh, have them constantly included in the process, especially early on, but throughout the entire development. So making sure that they're checking it, is the messaging coming through correct? Is something being misinterpreted? Um, and is something incorrect in the way that we've implemented it? Um, so things like that really help. Um, and creating a clear outline of what exactly you're supposed to teach from the very beginning and having the developers and the, and the design team understand that from the beginning is also really key. Um, so if we don't understand the content, how are we going to make a game that's going to create that messaging, right? So that's another thing that I think really should be done as early on as possible. Um, and designing game mechanics, as I said earlier, it's really got to be with serious games, uh, a collaboration and kind of a, a combination of the game mechanics and the content. Um, so designing those at the same time is kind of challenging and it's hard to say in every case exactly what you're supposed to be doing at what time, but it is really important to, to try and combine those as much as possible. Um, and as I mentioned, again, continuously involve those content experts. They really are helpful and it's very effective use of, of um, reviewing. And that's it for this one. <laughs>